Hello, and welcome to Treatment Update. I'm Jeff Berry, editor of Positively Rare Magazine, and we're here in Seattle at Croy to talk about the latest trends and developments in antiretroviral therapy. I have a great panel here to introduce, um, and once we get our introductions, we'll go right into it. Uh, first, we have Rick Ellian on my right. Hi, I'm Rick Ellian. I'm a clinical professor of medicine at George Washington University, and I uh, co-director of the HIV HCV treatment and research program at Providence Hospital. And I'm Jonathan Lee. I'm an associate, assistant professor of medicine at Brigham Women's Hospital uh, and Harvard Medical School. Great, thank you, Rick and John. Um, so, I guess the first question is, um, what is probably some of the more interesting topics that you've seen uh, presented at this conference? So for me, at least, I thought that the uh, presentation that Paul Sachs gave on Bictegravir, which is a new integrase inhibitor, was uh, some of the more exciting treatment uh, uh, kind of uh, investigative agents that have come along. Um, as you are well aware, um, integrase inhibitors have become a mainstay in intraterol therapy, and in particular, dolutegravir, or Tibicae, uh, has uh, been something that's been extremely popular recently. Um, and as a uh, backbone uh, option, uh, the, generally we use two NRTIs, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And the most popular ones involve tenofovir and, and FTC, known as Descov or Truvada. Uh, but there's no co-formulated version of, say, Descov and Tivacay because they're made by two different companies, right? So uh, Tivica is made by Vive and, and, uh, and Descovy is made by Gilead. And, and uh, the Bictegravir is kind of Gilead's response to Dolutegravir. Right, because it, it doesn't require boosting? That's exactly right. right. So, I mean, it has a lot of the same positive attributes as, uh, as Dolutegravir, as Tivica. It's uh, once daily dosing, doesn't require boosting. It's supposed to be well tolerated. Uh, and uh, it is also has a high barrier to resistance, which has been a, a big selling point for Tivica as it's the higher barrier to resistance means that it's um, more forgiving of uh, missed doses. And so in the phase two uh, study that uh, Paul uh, presented, uh, they showed that in comparison to uh, Tivica, Bictegravir had similar uh, efficacy rates, maybe even a little bit better, but at least, at least similar efficacy rates. And I know that there was a couple of, um, at least two uh, phase three studies that are now um, uh, are underway comparing uh, Bictegravir and, uh, and Tivica uh, in much larger studies. So, so that to me was most interesting. And I think what's interesting about it, there's two things. Number one, the fact that Gilead would develop a new drug while their existing STR, Gemvoya, which is Elvitegravir, Kobe, and Tavin FTC, is the leading STR. That they would develop something to replace it when it's so early and even it's since its release, I think it's only out in two years, mm -hmm. is, uh, is, is great for patients that they're, they're trying to do something better. And the, the challenge to all that is going to be the idea of, you know, Dalyategravir, because it's been a great integrase for us, it's been unboosted, but we have, it's been a little tricky. Uh, Triamec is a co-formulation with Abacavir 3TC, but there's some issues around uh, potentially with Abacavir. And so some interesting data at this meeting on the use of uh, Dalyotegravir and 3TC as well as Dalyotegravir and Ropivirine. And I guess the question is, you know, how little is enough and how much is too much? Is We've gotten to the point with Bictegravir and TAF and FTC that, you know, three drugs, incredibly well tolerated. Incidentally, it's a smaller pill because of the volume, mm -hmm. so it's really easy to take. And now we're go we'll say, well, maybe three simple is great, but maybe two drugs in one pill are even better. And so the dolutegravir ropivirine data looked very good as a substitute for uh, a, a nuke sparing regimen, but I think we're all really waiting on dolutegravir 3TC to see what that's going to be. Ropivirine has some caloric requirements and food when you have to take it. So the dolutegravir 3TC data continues to look good. Um, so I think it'll be interesting in, uh, when the phase three bictegravir studies are done and the dolutegravir 3TC studies go. It's certainly good for consumers. Consumers are going to have a wider choice than before, and the existing regimens are already great, and they're going to get better. Yeah. Which, which is always great. So I just wanted to mention to our viewers that um, so the dolutegravir ropivirine uh, combination is what we know as Tivica and um, Edurant, or ropivirine is also found in Odefsi and Complera. And so this is the first time we'd see a regimen that would be 
um, a two-drug regimen, as well as uh, with dalutegravir 3TC. 3TC is found in a number of drugs, but it's known as epivir. It's a very long, um, it was approved uh, very early on in, in, in the drugs you know, that we had in our early arsenal, but it continues to be a mainstay in treatment. Right. I, I mean, I'll say that you know, this is not the first time people have tried finding simplified regimens that don't use an NRTI, right? I mean, they there's just been didn't work as well. That's right. I mean, there, our history has been littered with trials that have littered nukes, is a good word. <laughs> nuke sparing regimens, right? You think about even some of the, you know, as our drugs are getting better, everyone wants to simplify, and especially if you want to try to avoid NRTIs as well. And even some of the best drugs that we have today, you know, for example, looking at darunavir and raltegravir in the NEAT study, right? Didn't work as well as darunavir and Truada. Uh, the uh, ACTG ran a study of darunavir and, um, uh, and raltegravir as well, also had a, a single arm that also showed high levels of virologic failure. Um, at a, at the recently published adazanavir and raltegravir study that showed that uh, it didn't do as well as adazanavir and Truvada. So, uh, but I think, you know, in this case, Tivacay or darunavir has been a game changer. I think that it's it, the fact that it has high barrier resistance, so well tolerated, uh, means that I think for the first time here that we're seeing really that this dalutegravir and uh, ropivirine uh, combination has, has, has looked fantastic. Well, I also think this, this conference served as a cautionary note to people who want to keep stripping that down even further. There was some studies looking at dalutegravir as monotherapy. And, you know, dalutegravir has been, everyone's talked about it with such sort of ardor because there's never been a resistance seen in naive studies. Well, that... that uh, that cloak came off the, uh, the horse, or whatever the expression would be, because the study showed that there was resistance seen when used dietegravir as monotherapy. And I think it's a cautionary note to providers and to patients about trying to be very reflective when you're trying to strip this regimen down. I think, you know, the test will be if two drugs work, but I think the test of, if monotherapy worked, which has already been done with PIs, didn't work, not done with uh, uh, integrase, didn't work. That was a cautionary note from this meeting. Yeah, and, and they, it wasn't that they just failed, but they also failed with resistance, yeah. which is hard to come by, right? right? These monotherapy trials, there was two of the two presentations, one poster and one presentation, and uh, emergence of dolutegravir resistance mutations in patients who never failed on, on an uh, integrase inhibitor. And it before. affected their future choices. Absolutely. So it was, it was a Absolutely. bad thing. I completely agree. Yeah. So, um, yeah, in terms of the food requirements, so um, it's... You know, for if you have uh, dalutegravir with ropivirine, if that's formulated into one pill, it's going to be small, first of all. Um, and so, if uh, if you get into a, a easy routine with it, and you just take it with your breakfast, it's really not an issue. No. Um, so, uh, I, I I guess I'm curious anecdotally if you have patients or you know of doctors who have patients, you know, who are already taking this regimen and and how they're doing, and um, if that's uh, something that you think uh, might be attractive to patients? I, I certainly have patients who are taking dietegravir and ropivirine, but almost very few of them are taking dietegravir and ropivirine alone. Because for almost all those patients, I leave 3TC on board. Because for those patients who are on ropivirine, usually they've had NRTI failure, so you can't use the other agents. And so I've been just reluctant uh, to leave them on just two drugs. And I think this study that they showed doesn't provide any more information on that. Th those studies didn't have extensive failures when people were put on those two regimens, and we don't know what the role of patients in extensive failures will be. So I, I think this, this strategy is, is, is fine for early treatment. Mm -hmm. I don't think we know at all if it's fine for later treatment. Yeah. And you bring up the dalutegravir and 3TC. I mean, there's a, a, um, a poster here showing that a dalutegravir 3TC uh, switch study uh, had excellent efficacy. Right. So and these were people who were already suppressed um, on a three-drug regimen, and then they were switched to a two-drug regimen right. containing those that's two exactly, drugs. That's exactly right. And it, but I was going to say, it's you know, I guess we, maybe we shouldn't be all that surprised at that result because some of the PI plus 3TC studies have also shown some pretty good results. So Dougie Tuggy is going to be probably better than PI, so I'm not surprised that that's the case. But there are now... Um, some ongoing bigger studies, too, looking at switch, including randomized studies of uh, dalutegravir and 3TC alone. And it's going to raise the question for you know, consumers, is two drugs better than three? Because TAF and FTC are very well tolerated. There's been a lot of studies, both confirmed at this meeting and before, that TAF is not tenofovir. It's better. It doesn't look to be uh, toxic. It's very well tolerated. It's safe. So why 
skip the three drug regimen to go to a two? Well, we don't know what pricing will be. You know, we don't know how they're going to compare. So it's going to be an interesting landscape. Although if you if, if you can really show that two drugs work, then the burden of proof is going to be on the person who wants to do the three, right? Sure, three might be well tolerated, but why, why run the risk? Three? Why run the risk of tenofovir, right? So I think, you know, if the Bictagravir study um, phase two looked pretty good, and, you know, if, even if their phase three looks great, I think their biggest challenge, and I think if you, if you do have a regimen today of Bictagravir plus Descovy, I think that would vault towards the top of the bestsellers list. Right? I think it would absolutely, but we just don't know. If, if, if there's a 40%, a let's say there's three drugs, so there's a 30% price reduction and more because mm. 3TC would be mm. generic. Yeah, sure. And the patient, we say to the patient, all right, your copay is going to be $50 versus $20. Mm -hmm. What impact that's going to make yeah. on regimen sure. selection? Yeah, so, sure. Pricing is a huge yeah. part I mean, of it. I, so I, I just want to, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say that I, I think the biggest challenge to Bictegravir and, and Descovy is probably going to be a two-drug regimen of, totally. of, uh, of Dolutegravir and, and 3TC, if that works. So. Good, point, good point. So there's a couple other things I just wanted to be sure to touch on. Um, there's a new non-nuke, uh, Duravirine, which is under development. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about why, why would we need this drug and what, who would it be advantageous for? Well, I, I, the question of need is a different question, but it, where deravirine is interesting, so deravirine was compared, so they, they developed, it's a non-nuke, a non it's a single pill, once a day, it's very small. It, it was uh, given with, um, I believe, tenofovir and FTC and compared against darunavir, and uh, the efficacy was exactly the same. Uh, you could argue that maybe the, the percentage of success was low, but it was a lot of pills that they had to take at one time. And I think that explains it. So I think Duravirin certainly got, uh, you know, on the, on the scoreboard at, at this meeting. The, que the question is, do we need it? I think where, where Merck is going is they, they see this as a way to start doing as tenofovir, not TAF, but tenofovir and 3TC are generic in the, in the next, 3TC already being generic, but tenofovir becoming generic in the next year. You start to be able to put together a regimen with two pills, two, two, three medicines, two of which are generic. And so it, again, raises the question about pricing mm. and how we're going to see the, these things start, start to evaluate. So I think that's where the benefit is, and, and, and I don't know how, I mean, how relevant do you think that'll be? Uh, I think it raises some uncomfortable questions, though, right? So again, last year at Croy, Duravirine was, uh, the results of phase two studies show that it was um, similar to Fabrin's. And now phase three results show it's similar to Darunvir. But we already have the results from the single trial and the Flamingo trial, both of which show that Dalutegavir is better than either one of those two, Ovifavirins or Darunavir. So you've got now Doravirine, which is equivalent to kind of a, almost, in some ways, a, some inferior regimens. Even if it's cheaper, um, you know, what, um, it, 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 you're running into who would you put on that, a, a possibly inferior regimen, even if it's a little bit cheaper, would you really do that? And, uh, you know, now you're getting into who can afford a better regimen than someone else. And, and but we don't know that it's worse. We, I mean, we don't the commutative know. property is always challenging. Sure, absolutely. And it doesn't have the food requirement of, you know, some of the other non-nukes, and, um, and the above 100,000, below 100,000, that looks to be not an issue as well. You know, part of what it is is I think we don't trust the resistance profile of new non-nukes yet. We don't have mm -hmm. enough experience, and we've been burned in the past, mm -hmm. and the integrases have given us a new comfort level around that. So I think it's going to be a little tough to certainly enter the market for them, that's for sure. Yeah, they have a high bar to, yeah. to overcome. Um, we don't have much time left, but I just wanted to touch real quickly on um, the long-acting agents. We have uh, cabotegravir and ropivirine. Um, being developed as a long-acting, it looks like right now, um, maybe once a month. And then um, uh, there's also a couple of other agents, Ibilizumab and Pro140. So there's a lot of different modes of delivery and um, uh, different kinds of uh, ways of accessing these newer agents that can potentially be really useful for certain populations. Well, the two most exciting that I thought, the, the cabotegravir and the law acting is clearly very exciting. There was some data with animals in the PrEP model with cabotegravir that showed some resistance that was a little concerning, but certainly for treatment, but that was cabotegravir alone. So cabotegravir and rapivirine is very exciting. And there was also a report of a new class, a capsid inhibitor, uh, that would be an injection that could last up to perhaps two months. So we still, it's just phase one data. But I think we're now starting to see the ability to have longer acting injectable agents, which is going to be a great thing, I think, for the field. I, I think it's tremendously exciting. 
both for prep and for treatment. Right. You know, it, um, it, the current formulations require, for treatment purposes, uh, monthly dosing. So that will limit the number of patients who might choose to have such a such right. an option, right? Um, but prep, I think they're they're looking at every eight weeks, so so every two months. Mm -hmm. And I think that that you know, prep uh, uh, drug adherence. It's the major barrier to uh, to prep working, and if you can have every two months, I think that would be an attractive option for a lot of people. No question. Great. Um, so uh, I think that's about all the time we have for today. I want to um, thank our panel, Dr. Jonathan Lee and Dr. Rick Ellian, um, for being here today. And um, for more uh, uh, webcasts of uh, the conference, you can go to croyconference.org. And uh, you can see webcasts there and also ab download abstracts from the conference. Um, until then, my name is Jeff Berry, and thanks for being here. <laughs>